Hi, it's Leslie with 22 Zines, and today I'm finally getting around to filming the intro for this little project that I've been doing, uh, which basically my goal has been to find as many books as possible that feature zines in them that are not themselves about how to make zines or some sort of, you know, historical or analytical perspective on zines. Basically, a bunch of fiction books and graphic novels that feature zines in the story. <laughs> so um, this is basically a collection of a bunch of those books that I read, and I read them incrementally as I checked most of them out from the library, so there are going to be a couple of time skips, but I know that you guys don't care about that sort of thing, <laughs> so we'll just dive right in. This all started when I found out about the Netflix movie Moxie, which is about a high school girl who is making zines and features zines prominently. It features some zines by a zinester that I follow named Jolie Ruin, who has some really amazing zines, and I'll link her below. And I found out that this Netflix thing that they're doing is an adaptation of a YA novel of the same title, Moxie. So I went ahead and checked this out from my uh, local library and read it almost as much out of a sense of duty as a zinester and a teen librarian than anything else. <laughs> and this basically started this whole um, interest now where I have tried to hunt down any and all books that I could find that featured zines in them. So a quick summary, Moxie is a YA novel that features main character Vivian, who is, geez, how old is she? Like 17, I think. Um, and basically, she is in a small Texas town in high school, and there's a whole bunch of sexist BS that happens at this high school that the administration does nothing about. So her response to this, inspired by her mom, who was a riot girl in the 90s, uh, Vivian's response is to make a zine called Moxie. And she creates this anonymous zine trying to unify the girls at her high school and in her small way fight against the experience, the um, instances of sexism that they experience. There are a few things that I really like about this book. For one, it is so exciting to come across the zine pages because they actually feature very zine-like pages in the book. So we see Moxie Girls Fight Back, and this is the first issue of her zine that she makes. And so we get a few of these. We get to actually see what the zines look like, which, of course, is the very first thing that drew me to this and that made me really excited. This book is very realistic, I think, in its depictions of high school and its depictions of social interactions. It doesn't go for too much um, dramatic flair, I suppose you'd say. Not that it's not interesting, just that um, it, it, a lot of it feels like this could happen at a real school. The example I can think of that really captures this is the description of the mandatory assemblies that the principal makes everybody go to. <laughs> And this is such BS, and it happens at high schools across the country, where the principal decides that they need to have a pep rally every week to get ready for some football game, or they just decide that they're going to use this excuse to get everybody in the student body together and try to talk, them, talk to them about something, and like 90% of the assembly is the principal telling everybody to shut up and telling everybody that they need to be respectful and blah blah blah. And it's like, the description of the principal and the description of these assemblies, like as soon as they had this mandatory assembly, I was like, oh, oh my god. <laughs> there are so many of these in high school, and I guess that's what really made it click to me that felt like, okay, this is a realistic story. Um, another example of this, and it's also something that I like about this book, is that there aren't instances of girls in the same class being mean to each other for no reason. Um, the I feel like there's this trope in YA fiction, 
um, where there's the main character is not like other girls and for whatever reason she has some blonde popular girl who is coming after her for no other reason than that the girl is blonde and popular. Does that make sense? Like that happens a lot in stories and I don't feel like it makes any sense. It certainly doesn't represent my high school experience where it's not like I've ever had, you know, it's not like it was perfect and I never had issues with bullies or never had issues with, um, other girls, you know, at the time being a girl, but this sort of trope of I'm the bitchy blonde girl who's going to look down on you and pick on you and trip you in the hallway for no reason. Like, it just always feels so artificial to me, you know? Um, this book does not do any of that. There is one character who I suppose fits the sort of stereotype of the blonde, super popular girl, but, you know, they make a point of saying that she's actually pretty nice and she doesn't you know, she is not an antagonist to the main character, and she's just sort of another girl who happens to go to that school. Um, which I think, I really appreciate that it's deviated from that trope, because that's, it's a very easy thing to do, and I think in a, in a book about zines that is specifically trying to focus on issues of sexism and issues from the administration and from a lot of the, you know, very aggressive and sexually aggressive boys in the school. I think this does, like, the whole blonde mean girl stereotype just is not, it, it wouldn't have fit very well in here, and so I'm really glad that they didn't do that. Overall, I'd say that I enjoyed reading this book. Um, however, <laughs> there are definitely a few things that I disliked about it, and a few points where I almost put it down. The first thing is that the LGBT representation is basically non-existent, and I think that is kind of pathetic for a book that is supposed to be about feminism written in 2017. I mean, like, come on, <laughs> you know? I think th they had, like, one lesbian couple who was closeted who the main character stumbled upon making out next to a dumpster for a page and having the main character say, don't worry, I'm not going to tell anybody, and then just moving on. There were no trans characters, and frankly, I think that it is at best a huge missed opportunity where this is supposed to be talking about feminism and talking about injustices that are being faced. And it feels like, hey, what would be a better topic to cover than having a, a character, even just a side character, like having a character who is a trans girl who is consistently bullied by the asshole boys in this school. Like that... That seems like it would be a a realistic and and just important thing to talk about. It feels like really what feminism is doing right now is trying to address and incorporate intersectionality within its feminism. And this book does not do that. It has a few instances where it sort of tries to get at racial intersectionality. So one of the best lines, and I'm going to probably be misquoting this slightly, but basically one of the main character's friends is a black girl named Kira who brings up this issue that um, she faces for being black. I don't want to spoil too much of the story, so I won't, I won't get into it, but basically she brings, she brings up this issue that has to do with her experience being black and how she's treated being black. The main character says, gee, I never thought of that, and then Kira says, well, you wouldn't have because you're white. And I feel like that is, I, I just, I really appreciate that line being in here. I wish there was more stuff like that. And I wish there were more things that really address 
intersectional issues, and obviously I wish that there were gay or trans main characters or side characters or literally anybody besides like a one page throwaway thing that it feels like her editor said you should insert. And I was genuinely, you know, I get two thirds of the way through the book and I start genuinely wondering, is the author transphobic or something? Does she not think that trans women are women? And that's why she's specifically not including them in this book. The author is not transphobic, at least not outwardly transphobic or anything. And there is this, you know, acknowledgments, sort of authors, um, statement, you know, kind of thing in the back that specifically says, you know, trans women are women. It's like, that's great. You want to maybe include that in your book? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I feel like one of the best opportunities for this even would have been to make the main character's boyfriend trans. And frankly, there's the scene at the beginning of the book that I'm reading. And then as soon as I say that, it clicks in my head and I'm like, oh my God, is he trans? Is he trans? That would be so fucking cool to have a trans guy and have him be the main love interest. Nope. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Instead of having that, they just, you know, ended up having him be like, oh, well, I'm still learning. And the main conflict, I guess, with him is that a few places he basically says not all men, which rightfully the main character calls out and gets frustrated with. But I also just feel like it's sort of a weird message. It's almost trying to be too realistic of, oh, well, you know, just you can you can forgive somebody for saying that as long as they're trying or trying to do better, which is like, that's true. Is that really the main point of this book, though, of trying to trying to fight sexism and call out sexism? Do you really want to add this other layer in there? And there, that happens in a few other places of basically like, well, you know, the main character says, I want my mom to be happy, so I guess it's okay that she's dating a Republican because not everyone has to be perfect. It's like, okay. But also they're kind of ignoring the fact that someone's politics often says a lot about them. They're ignoring kind of a lot of the a lot of the shitty things that the mom's boyfriend says and and just don't really address it enough. And sort of the same thing about her boyfriend even is like, you know, she gets mad and then she's more worried about the fact that they might have to break up instead of the fact that her boyfriend is going around saying not all men. Like there's just a few a few things like that that are a little disappointing, I suppose I would say. I'd still recommend this book, and I still enjoyed reading it, and I still really loved all the zine parts. Um, it's just like... I would have liked this book more and appreciated this book more if it had come out in, like, 2005. But the fact that this has come out in 2017... And there are so many things that they aren't addressing or aren't getting, uh, you know, just don't feel right. It's just kind of a letdown. I have not seen the Netflix thing, and I don't really plan to, because um, it seems like they've basically changed a lot of things from this book to make it even worse, <laughs> which kind of sucks. Um, but I would recommend reading this book, and just keep in mind that, you know, I guess I'd just say try not to get your hopes up too much. And I certainly wouldn't herald this as like the greatest piece of zine related literature out there. Um, but you know, it's worth the read. Next up, I have this little comic series called Jonesy. And um, this is, it was originally re released in paper comics and has, it was a little mini, mini series of 12 paper comics that have now been compiled into three um, compilation books. And it is about this main character, Jonesy, um, who is basically like Cupid without the arrows and super punk and super cool. <laughs> the, whole, um, the whole comic is very, um, very bouncy. It's very colorful. It's very young. 
Um, this is incredibly diverse and has queer representation, which is really awesome. Um, and it is, it is fun to read. I will say, as an adult, this took a little bit of adjusting for me, I suppose, to try and put myself into this mindset of a, um, of a hyperactive young teenager. I think the age is 15-ish is sort of the ages of the main characters. Um, there's sort of a lot of random randomness in it. Um, I think, I would say that it definitely reflects what a lot of youth subcultures look like now, which is great. And because that's, that's who it's for, right? You know, I sort of had my, my era. I had my, my more goth, gloomy grunge stuff. And this is like pop punk, I guess, in comparison. So the reason that this belongs in this category is because the main character makes zines and it is brought up multiple times throughout the, um, throughout the little series. And it's really fun. So it starts out with the main character, Jonesy, making zines, uh, like fanzines about her favorite pop star, who's basically, his name is Stuff, and it's basically like a combination between David Bowie and Daft Punk, I guess I would say, where he has this very star man persona that he tries to let out. And so the first few zines that she makes are uh, fanzines about Stuff, and she sells them at her dad's donut shop, which is really cool. They are not exactly the main part of the book. And in fact, probably most of the rest of these books are not, the zines are not going to be the main part, but they are a significant part. And I feel like it captures a lot about her energy and her character. And <laughs> so it's really nice having those, those zine components. Later on in the series, this is volume three out of three, um, <laughs> it goes even further into zines where she, um, after making these fanzines and sort of getting started with these fanzines, she starts making per zines and um, diary zines and zines about her friends, and it's really fun. And she goes there. There is a zine store <laughs> that she finds that features pretty, pretty prominently <laughs> a whole store for zines, and it's really, it's really cool. So she sells her zines there, and um, the owners of the zine store become pretty prominent characters, and it's just... zines become an even bigger thing, up until probably the the peak of, of the zine uh, experience, <laughs> whatever you would want to call it in this, is when she sends a zine to her zine friends, and the zine basically, the, the the this whole issue or chapter in this book is written and displayed as the zine that she sends her friends, and it's called "Hey Babies," and it's really <laughs> it's really fun. You get this, you get the stickers, you get the, you know, it's basically like a hand drawn representation of a zine or of of receiving a zine and. It's, it's just, it's so fun, and, and it's acting as sort of just, what would you call it, like, just before the climax of the story. Um, here, I'm just, here I am showing off all the zine pages, but they're, they're really good. So, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this series. One thing I really like, I love the character designs. I love all the clothes that they have in this. It's really fun. And it, and it is a fun read. It, they're pretty quick to read. Um, very lighthearted and, um, very diverse. <laughs> like there is a lot of gay love in this whole series that, you know, it's, it's great. And, and they really should do that with a, you know, their main character being Punk Cupid, basically. <laughs> um, and there is also, there is racial diversity, there is diversity in body 
shapes, body types. The things that I don't like so much about this series are that um, it feels a little bit like some of the story threads don't entirely get satisfied, and um, that might just have to do with the nature of being a serially published um, paper comic book. Um, I don't read a whole lot of those, but I, I think that maybe the expectations are a little bit different. So, you know, it certainly wasn't intended or wasn't originally written to be purchased as this three volume set and read all together in one go as though it's a single graphic novel. And it definitely, you can tell that it wasn't intended to be that. It's also a little hard to follow at a couple of times, just because there is so much going on on every single page. It is so incredibly colorful, which is of course part of its charm, but <laughs> it is admittedly like a lot going on and sort of hard to read. That might just be me being kind of an old fart about it. <laughs> but anyway, I do really highly recommend these uh, <laughs> these graphic novels or whatever you'd want to call them, these comic anthologies. Um, and I think it's a really great read. It's really fun. And if you have kids or teens, then, or you are a kid or a teen, then this is highly, I highly recommend it. If you are a kid or a teen, I'm sorry for swearing so much. The next series that I'm going to talk about is one that many of you are probably intimately familiar with. And that is the Captain Underpants series. Um, these were absolutely a staple of my childhood. Depending on your childhood, you may not be familiar with them, which is a shame. <laughs> so I will quickly summarize them. Basically, it's the series about these two pranksters named George and Harold. And basically, they have they write comics and make mini comic zines that they share with all of their school friends with their primary series being about a superhero named Captain Underpants. And the, uh, <laughs> there are some other series that they do too. They have one called, uh, Dog Man. They have the, uh, Cafeteria Ladies. They have a whole bunch of these, the, uh, Super Diaper Baby. They have a whole bunch of other little comics thrown out, throw, or, you know, spread, spread throughout. And what I really love about all of these is that they feature the actual comics that the kids make in, you know, in this drawn style. <laughs> in, in all of the, in all of the books. When I was a kid, that was my absolute favorite part was the kids, the kids comics and the kids drawings because I also made comics and I also loved to draw as a kid. So <laughs> I really enjoy that. And to make the argument, to further the argument that these are indeed zines and not simply comics, <laughs> um, I'm just going to point out this little, uh, this little bit from the beginning of the first book. Luckily for the boys, the secretary at Jerome Horowitz Elementary School was much too busy to keep an eye on the copy machine. So whenever they got a chance, Harold and George would sneak into the office and run off several hundred copies of their latest Captain Underpants adventure. After school, they sold their homemade comics on the playground for 50 cents each. And if that is not a couple of kids pulling a copy scam to publish their zine, then I don't know what is. It's been really fun rereading these. As an adult, I haven't read them in many, many years, and even if you are an adult who has not read them, I I really think that you should, because I think, for one, they're just straight up enjoyable, but also I feel like this gives such insight to um, what it is to be a kid. The author captures what it feels like to be a kid and what it feels like to be a kid zinester. And it's just so inspiring and kind of, in a weird way, it's just kind of reminded me what I love making about zines and going back to my roots. Like, you know, I never had a treehouse like these two, but you know, just, just making zines 
as a kid and um, begging my mom to let me use the photocopier and having her tell me no because it's too much toner and <laughs> just, you know, like, just all these little, these little zine memories. And if you are not an experienced zinester and you have not been making zines your entire life, I think that this can still be very liberating. And I'm about to get super pretentious here, but it's like, you know, what's that quote? It's like Picasso, I think, who said, I spent my entire life learning to paint as a child or something like that. I mean, that's basically, <laughs> that's basically what it is, is that I think that there's a lot to, a lot to be gained from, um, loosening up, <laughs> I guess. And, um, reminding yourself not to take things too seriously and, you know, the comics that they, that George and Harold make in the, in the series are all full of spelling errors and they are not super professionally drawn or anything like that. And that is the fun of it. And that's kind of the point of it. And that's really what zines should be about. So if you, if you are intimidated by making zines in any way, first of all, I'm, you really shouldn't be. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, but if you are trying to break that intimidation, seriously, just check out the, any, really any issue or, or any, you know, any Captain Underpants book that you can get your hands on, but, you know, nothing wrong with starting with the basics and going with the first one and just kind of remind yourself what you love about zines, what it's like to be a kid and what it's like to be creating without fear of um, getting in trouble. That's the other thing that's really nice is that the, you know, the main characters, they don't want to get in trouble, but at the same time, they're pretty used to getting in trouble and they're not going to let the fact that they could potentially get in trouble stop them from making a whole bunch of really cool comics. Um, so take a lesson from them, <laughs> read these books again, read them over and over, and, you know, remind yourself what you really love about zines. And isn't that really kind of what what a book about zines should do ultimately is inspire you to continue making your own, right? And the last fiction book featuring zines that I have to uh, highlight slash review is The Vinyl Princess. And this is by uh, Yvonne Prinz. And um, I picked this up where basically the uh, main character... Allie makes a zine about records and her record collection. She is obsessed with vinyl. She works at a record store. And so she decides to make a zine that's actually like, it's sort of a zine to advertise her blog is how it's presented. But I kind of feel like the zine and the blog, at least in this book, they go, they go pretty hand in hand. <laughs> um, so there in this one are unfortunately no images of the actual blog, but it does have quite a few lists of her uh, favorite albums and the things that, you know, the content that she includes in the zine anyway. <laughs> so uh, this was a really fun read. I really enjoyed it in no small part because it takes place in Berkeley, California, where I used to live and quite a few locations are talked about and mentioned in detail. It talks about the Ashby Flea Market, which, <laughs> you know, was really close to my house. And it talks about uh, Telegraph Avenue, where she works at a fictional record store that might as well have been any of the multiple record stores that are on Telegraph Avenue. Um, and I just really liked it. I suppose the style of the book, it's sort of like a... Um, uh, it's more casual, I guess. It's, it's like, a uh, slice of life. I think that's, what, that's the word I was trying to look for, where it talks about her, um, burgeoning music blog and, you know, her mom is, um, starting to date again, which is a lot for her to deal with. And, you know, just, working at the record store brings up a lot of things for her. And so anyway, it's, it's really interesting. And it actually has an incredibly exciting climax. Like a lot of books, they have sort of a weird sag in the middle. This one has, does not have that problem at all. <laughs> and it was really 
just completely enthralling to read. I really liked it. I liked almost every part of it. Um, the character, the main character, one thing that I like about her, she's a teenager. I can't remember exactly how old she was, 16, 17, something like that. And she, um, the voice that they use to write her feels very much like a teenager and very much like a sort of jaded teenager who already is upset about how records are supposedly dying out in favor of <laughs> digital music. And this is, it, it takes place in modern times. I think this was written in like 2017 or uh, something like that. I don't totally remember. And it doesn't have it handy dandy. Well, now I'm, now I'm bothering to look it up. Oh, 2010. I guess it's a little older than I thought. But, you know, it's relatively modern. Um, and <laughs> uh, the main character just has this great, biting, <laughs> um, sarcastic uh, flavor, I guess. But in a way that doesn't make her a jerk. <laughs> um, I just really... I just really enjoyed it. The one thing that I didn't like about it is that, unfortunately, as many teen books often do, it sort of ends in in being a romantic thing, and, you know, the conclusion is, is very heavy on the romance aspect, which felt a little odd, especially because romance wasn't, like, a huge part of the book throughout. It just always felt like another piece of a very realistic life, and then it kind of became the whole life towards the end. And there were a few parts that were just like a little creepy, a little like forcing it too much. Um, I feel like it almost would have been better just to not have any romance, or at least start like after the middle, after the very dramatic climax to be like, yep, okay, not gonna, <laughs> not gonna do romance, at least with the main character anymore. Um, but, you know, it didn't, it didn't make me hate it. And, and overall reading the book was still very enjoyable. Um, <laughs> so I, yeah, I do recommend it. So that's all the fiction books that I have to show off. And I'm sure that there are other works of fiction that feature zines in some way. <laughs> um, and if you have any recommendations, then definitely let me know. Um, and I guess I will see you next time. Bye.